Ja. Hallå. Ja, då är ni välkomna till ett nytt program här på Globala torget på bokmässan i Göteborg. Eh, här på Globala torget är ju det stället på bokmässan där de verkligt viktiga samtalen förs. Ett femtiotal svenska organisationer som arbetar med att göra världen bättre. Och vi har just lyssnat på ett samtal om Ukraina och nu kommer något som anknyter till det. Vi ska prata runt temat sanktioner. Sydafrika, Ryssland, står Marokko på tur. Bojkott och sanktioner historiskt och idag. Och den som ska leda det här samtalet är Laszlo Salveselini från Björk och Frihet. Och sen är också då Senja Bachir här som är Polisarios representant i Sverige. Så varsågod, ordet är ert. Det blir på engelska ska jag säga, så ni hänger med på det. Tack så mycket. Jag tar bara en kort introduktion på svenska. Jag heter då Laszlo Charles Verseleni, sitter i styrelsen för Björk och Frihet. Vår monter är precis bakom den här lilla väggen här, om ni vill besöka oss senare. Och som sagt, samtalet blir på engelska. Så, so, boycott and sanctions are yet again on everyone's lips. When, the, uh, when does the world choose boycott as a method? And when does boycott succeed? And when does the world not choose boycott? Western Sahara has been occupied by Morocco for decades. And for many years, the UN forces have been in place without any results. I am discussing these issues with Senia Bahir, uh, the Swedish representative of the Frente Polisario. Please, Senia, can you introduce yourself and the Frente Polisario? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Senia El Bashir, and I am the Polisario Front representative in Sweden. Um, just before I begin introducing myself, a uh, show of hands, how many people have heard of Western Sahara? Oh, okay. Very good. <laughs> Um, so I come from uh, Western Sahara and as uh, you have uh, rightly said, Western Sahara is uh, uh, considered Africa's last colony. Yep, you've heard that right. In the 21st century, in 2022, we still have a colony in Africa and that's my country, Western Sahara. I was born and grew up my whole life in refugee camps in Southwest Algeria. So I'm very privileged to uh, be here representing my people, our cause here in Sweden. Um, the Polisario Front or Frente Polisario is the national liberation movement of Western Sahara. Um, in fact, it was established in 73 to uh, get rid of Spanish colonialism. But little did we know that only three years later, we will be actually uh, fighting and uh, trying to get rid of two occupying powers, which was Morocco and Mauritania. Uh, right now, Western Sahara is literally a divided country under Morocco's occupation for now 47 years. I've never been to the occupied territories since, like I said, been born and raised in the refugee camps. Um, Western Sahara is divided by one of the longest military walls in the world, 2,700 kilometers long with millions of landmines. The occupied territories of Western Sahara are qualified and described as the worst place uh, in the world for human rights defenders, for activists, it's literally a black hole for media and for information. And no one really knows the extent of the human rights violations and the systematic enforced disappearances, torture, imprisonment, and fair trials that go on um, and reported and, and, and accounted for in the occupied Western Sahara. Um, the biggest maybe development that has happened is that about two, a year and a half or not, uh, almost two years in November 2020, uh, Western Sahara returned to war after almost 30 years of peace. We tried that. It didn't work. Now we have returned to war. So right now uh, there is an active war happening in, in Western Sahara between the, the Polisario Front Liberation Army and the Moroccan occupying forces. Um, and all of this continues to go without Morocco ever being held accountable or uh, sanctioned. Yes, thank you so much for 
letting us know a little bit about the background of uh, Western Sahara and its occupation. So, uh, sanctions. Why is Morocco not yet sanctioned? It is a very good question uh, because what we have seen um, is that sanctions tend to really work very well. They've worked uh, effectively uh, during apartheid in South Africa. Um, right now, they're now making a major difference uh, in the war in Ukraine. Um, so the question is, why hasn't Morocco been sanctioned? Well, Morocco, unfortunately, is one of those very important allies for European countries. And uh, Morocco continues to violate, continues to occupy, continues to oppress Sahrawi people on a daily basis under the protection, in fact, of the European countries, especially France, Spain, um, and the European Union at large. And the, the issue here is that Morocco is a, a strategic ally to the European Union. It keeps the gate closed in, uh, for Europe, so it doesn't allow uh, Im immigrants uh, to uh, cross uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and into Europe. Um, but uh, it, it is so ironic that it only takes uh, that little of uh, blackmail by Morocco to open the gates for immigrants and for refugees, in fact, for people who actually need international protection. And the European Union uh, keeps it quiet and it gives Morocco millions of dollars to continue um, to uh, close its borders to refugees and to migrants. And that's the only reason that Morocco hasn't been held accountable is because it's an important ally. Uh, it obeys uh, European orders and uh, Europe also complies with Morocco's orders and I think it's unfair I think it's uh, not right because occupying powers need to be held accountable and one of the ways to do that is to sanction is to impose restrictions is to call them out and put pressure on them and Morocco needs to uh, to to be held accountable once and for all because we're coming to almost 50 years of occupation how much longer do we have to to keep fighting yes so Calls for sanctions are made, calls for boycott are made, but they fall on, as we see, deaf ears in Europe, in Sweden. Both the European Union and especially Sweden has posited it on the world map for the last 20 or 40 years as a humanitarian superpower, so-called. But uh, we see no action. But could you perhaps specify some uh, areas where sanctions are relevant? For example, areas of... Uh, economy or resources and such? Um, well, maybe we can go back to the question, why is Morocco interested in Western Sahara to begin with? Uh, well, Western Sahara is one of the richest territories in uh, natural resources. It has the largest phosphate reserve in the world, and we know phosphate is important for fertilizers and therefore for the food that you have, the food that we ate for lunch today. And also it has one of the uh, biggest and richest fishing coasts in the world. And the European Union and European vessels have been fishing in those waters for many, many years. Um, so of course, naturally Morocco uh, is benefiting from the exploitation and the plundering of the natural resources illegally in the occupied Western Sahara. And uh, it does so with the help of the European Union, with the help of uh, European companies, Swedish companies, uh, Spanish companies, uh, French companies, uh, to just name a few. Um, and uh, I think that one of the maybe the most powerful tools for any occupying power is to close the, the, uh, the tap on them. And if Morocco is pressured economically, if the, uh, the companies are, are stopped from illegally investing and exploiting and extracting the natural resources of Western Sahara, maybe then Morocco will feel the pressure. Um, and uh, right now, for a few years now, the European Court of Justice has made several decisions regarding the agreements between the European Union and Morocco which have illegally included Western Sahara um, in those agreements. Um, uh, and the, the, court, uh, the European Court has ruled 
four times so far that these agreements are illegal and should should be stopped. Um, and uh, but the European Union instead has appealed and appealed and appealed those decisions. Uh, it's right now at the highest uh, and the last stage of appeal. Um, and I'm always amazed. I'm like, okay, your your legal system is saying this is not right. This is illegal. You shouldn't invest in in occupied land. And yet you are also challenging your legal system. Um, I'm always also amazed that what is it that that the European Union, uh, that Morocco rather has against the or over the European Union to continue to give up or to give in the pressure of Morocco, especially when it comes to Western Sahara. So for me, one is to stop uh, companies from investing and importing and export uh, importing especially uh, products from Western Sahara. Two, to also uh, boycott uh, tourism in Morocco. Um, imagine you're going uh, for a visit in Marrakesh. Some of the most famous um, squares in Marrakesh, underneath those squares, Sahrawi activists uh, from the occupied territories of Western Sahara were arrested, jailed, and tortured. So literally, as you walk around, people might be underneath tortured. And that needs to, to, to also come out. Um, and three, of course, is to call on uh, your own governments to really put pressure on Morocco to once and for all respond and uh, respect international law. This is international legality. We cannot allow for this to continue uh, without accountability, like I said earlier. Thank you for that very insightful uh, reflection, Senia. Uh, could you maybe also, you, you gave us a very good example of how uh, the Moroccan regime hides its crimes. When you walk in a Casbah in uh, Marrakesh, you might be walking on top of the uh, crimes of the regime. Do you have any other examples of how, um, uh, how Morocco tries to greenwash or in other ways hide uh, it's crimes against the Sahrawi people. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, I'm glad that you brought up the idea of greenwashing. What Morocco has been very good at is uh, uh, attracting investors in wind and solar energies in the occupied territories under the disguise of renewable energy, green energy, and essentially greenwashing the occupation. Um, Siemens is one of the companies involved with the windmill uh, uh, stations in the occupied cities of Western Sahara. Morocco is also building solar panels. This I have to mention Western Sahara is naturally largely arid and so of course we have plenty of sun <laughs> uh, and, and that energy is now being harnessed to, uh, to power the occupation itself and Morocco uh, is saying oh look at us we're a good example of renewable energy we're a good example of sustainability but it's using all of that to uh, power and greenwash its occupation of Western Sahara unfortunately. Yes, thank you. So you mentioned already um, what we in Europe, what we in Sweden should do, um, a, a way for us to hold uh, uh, Morocco accountable, the occupation accountable, is to actually hold our politicians uh, accountable and, for example, not participate in the greenwashing and all kinds of washing of the Moroccan o occupation uh, through tourism. Uh, but we are here today at a um, um, literature fair, a book fair. Uh, do you have any reflections on what specifically literary workers in the arts or in science uh, can contribute to the liberation of Western Sahara? Um, absolutely. One of uh, maybe our uh, biggest issue has been Western Sahara was often referred to as the forgotten conflict. Very few people actually know about Western Sahara, know that it's uh, an occupied country and it's a colony. So we need more written work. We need more information, both in literature, uh, in uh, fiction, non-fiction, academic uh, work. Um, and that's very important to 
to bring the attention to Africa's last colony and to, to tell people that there is an ongoing occupation, there is an ongoing violations of human rights uh, in the doorsteps of, of Europe. And if anything, what happened in Ukraine with the invasion and the war is, is what we have warned for many years as, as people in Western Sahara. We've said we cannot allow another country to uh, use force, use military to illegally occupy another country. Because if that happens, someone else will do it. And guess what? In 2021, another country did exactly that in Europe. And uh, if that continues, the pattern will just continue elsewhere. The bigger fish will eat the smaller fish. And then what kind of world would we live in if we allow bigger, more powerful countries that have bigger and more powerful allies to uh, invade and occupy and oppress other much smaller countries? This is not international law. This is not an international order. We cannot live in a chaotic world. Thank you. And we are starting to run out of time. So just uh, for final reflections to send along uh, with our um, audience, uh, what would you recommend them to do uh, after this seminar? Uh, how can they follow the work of, uh, follow your work and the work of the Frente Polisario, for example? Well, uh, I'm happy to talk to you throughout these days if you want to hear some more. I um, highly recommend that you uh, read more about Western Sahara. There are a lot of resources in Swedish. Um, there are many amazing organizations who are here with their stands, including uh, Björk of Frihet and MO Stockholm. I will be here those four days. I'm happy to talk to all of you uh, more concretely. But what I really hope that you take with you is that this is your cause as well as much as it is mine, because uh, it is our collective responsibility to get rid of occupation, to get rid of colonialism once and for all. And I really hope that you will take this message with you home, to your family, to your friends, uh, maybe post about it in social media. I hope that you can reach out to your local and your uh, members of parliament. Uh, make sure that this is in their minds constantly, nonstop. And yes, uh, what is happening here in Ukraine, in Europe, is very important. But we also have to make sure that we remember that other people are also suffering elsewhere. And we all, as, as people, uh, have the responsibility to make sure that our plights, our struggles are not forgotten, are not marginalized, are not silenced. I think to, uh, to conclude, um, I hope that you are uh, the voices that we really need here in Sweden. And uh, I'm very hopeful that we can gather that kind of uh, uh, momentum to make sure that in 2022, we end occupation of Western Sahara once and for all. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you everyone in the audience for having listened to us. Thank you so much, Senia Bashir. Thank you to the Polisario Front. Thank you for the Sahrawi people for carrying the torch of liberation for all of humanity, not just for themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our stand is at the other side of this little pink wall, so please come visit us. Thank you.